Dr. Amber Enright, and I'm here with Dr. Brooke Chalet on today's episode of Between Two Cacti. This podcast is brought to you by Scottsdale Living. We are a community group that is meant to connect businesses and uh, the community with resources. So recommendations for people who are amazing in the community, who have stood out, and also business owners in the community like local uh Dr. Brooke Chalet. So Dr. Brooke Chalet actually owns a company called Chalet Wellness, and she is a doctor of psychiatry. Dr. Brooke is a board certified concierge psychiatrist, the founder of Chalet Wellness, Scottsdale Concierge Psychiatry and Therapy, and she's also the co-founder of La Jolla Concierge Psychiatry. Dr. Chalet sees children, teens, and adults specializing in ADHD anxiety, executive performance, and sports psychiatry. And in fact, she's also the, um, was voted best psychiatrist in the Valley in 2022. She is the team psychiatrist for the Suns and the Mercury, right, here in Arizona? Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay, so um, can you tell me a little bit about, when, when did you actually get your degree? So I graduated from medical school in 2017, and then I started the long route of training in your subspecialty and residency and fellowship. So I did three years of adult psychiatry and then two subsequent years of child and adolescent psychiatry fellowship. Uh, and so as you've been practicing, what are some of the things that you're like, I'm a psychiatrist <laughs> and people just don't know about what psychiatry even is, you know, like, what is it? What is psychiatry? Yeah, I think there's a lot of misinformation, good information, (laughs) vague information out there about the mental health industry. So psychiatry is a medical study, and it's basically the treatment and diagnosis of mental health conditions using both medications and therapy. And so that's one of the ways that psychiatry differs from psychology, where psychology is just focused on therapy-based practices and does not have a medication management component of things. Okay. Um, So when people are thinking like, okay, I'm, you know, we just came out of a crazy pandemic Mm -hmm. and there's a lot of emotions. People are very uncertain right now about everything. I mean, it could be anything, emotions, money, relationships, everything can feel really nuts when things are volatile. So when people are feeling these things, when is the right time to say, wow, I don't think these things are in control or is it way sooner than that, that you're like, you should seek an assessment? Yeah, I think it's a great question because there's never a bad time. I tell people, even people with little stressors in their life or who say that that kind of everything's fine, everyone would benefit from kind of finessing some of their communication styles or relationships. And so I don't think there's ever a bad time. We have some people that wait until they're in crisis and kind of stuff's hitting the fan and they're like, I need help now. And then there's people that want to proactively get ahead of something and kind of seek out care ahead of time. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense. I think that obviously it's like, most people don't go to the doctor until they're feeling pain. Mm -hmm. Like pain's the number one reason people go in to see their physician. So the same thing with mental and emotional health is, you know, they might be really overwhelmed before they're ready to seek help. So is part of what you do preventative as well? And how do you promote that side? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I'd really like to think that I, I focus on preventative health as well as treating acute conditions because I think when people have a certain skill set or they have certain tools in their toolbox, then when they need to fix something, they have the appropriate resources to do so. Mm -hmm. So I think it has to do a lot with educating the public on what are the benefits potentially of seeking mental health care before something gets acute and is a big stressor. Mm -hmm. So um, Dr. Burke is a friend of mine and we actually met earlier this year. So I'm a doctor of physical therapy, and I met her because I was looking for wellness providers and mental health providers for some of my patients. And I personally, in my business, I like to refer to people that I know are really good. Mm -hmm. So I need to meet them. I need to kind of vet them before I go in. And I don't know if you can hear in her voice. She's like a very mellow person. (laughs) She's calm and organized. She's got like youthful energy. Um, she's like a glowing personality that's very stable. That's that's Thank what I you. think of when you if you called me and I was in distress. <laughs> you could easily like coach me out of that <laughs> moment in ten seconds. Um, and so um, it was nice to come into your business seeking that, and you didn't know your business didn't know that that's really what I was seeking. Mm-hmm. Um, and so immediately we kind of became friends. Um, but 
uh, there, and there are some things I thought were really cool about your background personally that may or may not have led you into this, but I want to kind of delve into that. So tell me a little bit about your family history in psychiatry, not like medical, but tell me a little bit about how you came into why you wanted to do this job. Yeah, it's it's an interesting story. My grandpa is a child and adolescent psychiatrist, and my mom's a child and adolescent psychiatrist, so it's kind of in the bloodline. Uh, so I knew I wanted to do something in medicine. We have a lot of physicians in our family, but once I went to medical school, went through all of the electives and different rotations, I kind of fell in love with psychiatry all over again and made that decision for myself. Mm-hmm. Um, but what's interesting is my mom and my grandpa did very different practices in psychiatry. My grandpa was in juvenile detention centers working with the community mental health and teens in distress in Ohio and Columbia, Missouri. And then my mom is private practice, but solo. And she's been solo and kind of alone in her own group for the last 20 some years. So is she, is she the other co-founder of La Jolla? She is. So when I started... What's the full title of it? La Jolla Concierge Psychiatry. So when I started the group in um, in Scottsdale here, I told my mom, I'm like, you know, you've been doing this for so long. You are so well respected in your community. I really think we should grow um, a practice in San Diego. And so she had always been DDT or Dr. Donna Talks was her kind of entity in San Diego. And I'm like, let's build something together over there. Oh, I love that. Yeah. That's really amazing. I mean, not everybody grows up with parents who are physicians, let alone psychiatrists. Was mm-hmm. that Do you think that your experience growing up was special because of your 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 family? Like the structure, the the tools that they had in mm-hmm. development? Yeah, I think so. I I think she's the best mom ever. <laughs> I, I think she that. uh, you know, did an amazing oh. job raising us. She's my best friend. I when I have this baby in 4 weeks, she'll be in the delivery room <laughs> with me. So. Okay, yes, Dr. Brooke is also 36 <laughs> weeks pregnant and I went to her baby shower last week and she was literally playing pickleball. Um, her family is clearly impressive people, but I got to meet your mom for the first time. Yeah. And she is also like she's an enigmatic personality. She's mm-hmm. all energy and mm-hmm. she's reading you at the same time as she's delivering information. Just brilliant people that yeah. you come from and, Thank you. and it sound like very um super caring. In fact, she shared something with me I I want to share that she was talking about. And I don't know if you remember this. I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I guess we're doing an interview. <laughs> uh so um your mom was talking about things that she said to you about like your purpose in life and mm-hmm. what she wanted for you growing up. And she used this like kind of humanitarian vision is what I felt like the message was. Do you yeah. remember or do you want to share some of what your parents like tried to, inst- your mother especially has tried to instill in you about what your role should be as an adult, as you go into the world? Yeah, they always focused on serving the community and serving mankind and mm-hmm. kind of having a role or a job where you could do that as a career. Mm -hmm. So for me, growing up, seeing her, not directly in the office, but seeing her kind of role in her job as helping people and kind of helping them during challenging times, good times, seeing them through major life events, to me seemed really fulfilling and rewarding. Mm -hmm. And that's why I was interested in doing something similar. But you're right, that's a message they kind of raised us with was, well, you're put on this earth, so what can you do for the community? Yeah, I love that. She said for the community mm-hmm. and for mankind, like, I don't, you know, like, oh, you're going to grow up and go to college. You're yeah. going to do something good. You're going to, it was that you're going to, the purpose of adulthood was to be able to take care of yourself mm-hmm. and be independent. And your mother gave you a mission much earlier in life to help the world, mm-hmm. to be a better person and to help other people be better person, better people to yeah. serve. I don't know a better job that you could have selected to do that. You know, and coming yeah. from a person who likes to take care of people <laughs> in a special way, yeah, I think that that's really, really meaningful. It's very impactful. It actually, you know, that I think it's a reason that I'm drawn to you. So I think it's really cool. Thank you. Um, yeah. So it, it is impressive. Were there other things about growing up that you felt were really different because you had, you know, this background of, of parents and grandparents who were so well versed in what you might have been going through that make made you calm. I mean, you have a brother too, right? Yes. Uh Uh-huh. And so are you both kind of similar that way, like well-balanced people? We are both similar and people don't believe me when I say this, but I grew up in a home with no fighting. So there was no 
arguing and, and people yeah they laugh they're like no there's no way you were never yelled at and there's no yelling in your house I'm like I don't know how it happened but that's how we grew up you know there was always conversations about things um, rather than kind of criticism or conflict mm-hmm. and so just talking through something explaining reasoning was done very early on and so maybe that's what made us maybe mature a little bit faster we just had to be logical and kind of figure things out for ourselves. Mm-hmm. Um, but there was really no conflict in, in our home. And I think that maybe is because of their back, my mom and grandpa's background in child psychiatry. Absolutely. Well, that yeah. sounds really amazing. Yeah. Like, I, I do think that that's obviously a really rare thing. For yeah. People be like, wow, I've never even envisioned that that could be a thing. Right. Um, so now you're married. Mm-hmm. And what does your husband do? He's an internal medicine physician at Mayo Clinic. So he sees patients that are admitted to the hospital from the ER and kind of undergoing a workup in the hospital. Mm -hmm. And so when you guys are like, you're obviously about to become a mother for the first time. Congratulations. I can't wait to hold your baby. (laughs) Um, You know, is that something that you're like, you both have this vision that that's how raising your children will be? And is that part of, uh, is that part of being not just a professional, but like a successful person, you know, imagining the success Mm -hmm. of how we're doing. Is that also what kind of drives you into, I know you treat high performance individuals like pro athletes, executives, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Do all of those go together? I'd like to think so. Kind of, I think the way that, and what drew me to my husband was that he was very family oriented and really wanted to be at home a lot of the time, didn't want to be absent, wanted to be at, you know, sporting events and things like that with kids growing up. Mm -hmm. So he's in a role where he works full time, but based on how many hours a day he works, his full time is 13 days a month. So we both kind of chose jobs that have flexibility in allowing us to be home, not only together to raise our kids together, but also be a stable kind of presence for our children. So I think kind of what I what I preach in my professional life, I'm also trying to apply to my personal life. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, probably we shouldn't be telling our patients like, hey, you should do this. Right. We're not willing to at least do it ourselves. Exactly. So I love that, like practicing what you preach. Um, so your business itself, tell me a little bit about your business. Like if I call in and I'm mm-hmm. like, my gosh, I'm overwhelmed. I really have to get in. Yeah. What happens? Sure. So Shule Wellness, uh, we founded uh, in 2021, my husband and I, and we are a psychi- psychiatric psychology and counseling practice. So we have both um, psychiatrists that are MD or DOs. um, And that means that they went to medical school and can prescribe medications. We have psychologists that have a PhD or a PsyD. And then we also have counselors that are licensed professional counselors or LPCs. Um, So we offer a variety of services for a variety of kind of fee ranges to fit different people's needs and preferences in the community. Um, but when you when someone calls in, they speak to our client care coordinator, kind of get triage for what they're looking for, how we can best help, um, if they're looking for medication therapy, kind of what's the best fit. And then she kind of matches them with who would be the best either provider or physician at the clinic. And once they get enrolled in the clinic, they can contact their provider directly by text, phone, email. Um, We even offer home visits. So we try to be as available as possible because in mental er, and just healthcare these days, access is a real difficulty sometimes. Mm -hmm. I know there's patient portals now in the hospital systems and but, you know, call queues can be really long for just trying to Terrible. call an outpatient the clinic. Worst. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you're talking about ER times basically multiplied by months now because, and in Arizona, we actually, in Scottsdale uh-huh. in particular, people come here because they want to get the best of something. Like right. that's, that's a Scottsdale culture thing, right? The food, the doctors, like whatever mm-hmm. they're, they're looking for, they're looking for something really, really good. Yeah. Um, and so it, it is kind of interesting because that's a special, that's a special audience and mm-hmm. culture that we treat here or like have access to, I guess. But um, when people come in, I think even for me in particular or from anyone I've heard from, Mm -hmm. they're hesitant to make that phone call about mental health. They're really, Mm -hmm. because it puts them, I don't know, into a category of things maybe they never thought of themselves as before. Like, oh my gosh, am I going crazy? How do I know, like, you know, how do I know the difference between I need a wellness service and Mm -hmm. I need something different? And this is obviously a thing when you go see someone who is a private provider, Mm -hmm. 
versus I'm going to someone through my insurance that I don't know. I obviously want to have that connection with somebody. Right. I'm, I may be paying out of pocket for reduced wait time to come in and see you. Mm-hmm. So what does that look like? How, what's your normal wait time like if I call in today and I'm like, I need to talk to someone. It depends on the urgency. Well, to talk to get in for an appointment or just to access someone at the clinic? Maybe either. Yeah, so they can get a call answered right away by the client care manager during business hours, and there's someone available to speak to them at all times during business hours. And then we can get people in for an appointment depending on availability and if we're the right fit for their needs within 24 to 48 hours. Wow. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, and so that's just for a general appointment too? Like mm-hmm. people might be waiting just a couple of days to get in? Yeah. Okay. Just for an initial consult. Wow. Yeah. Um, I remember looking up some of these resources through insurance providers for patients, and mm-hmm. we were talking about like a two-month wait just to get in for an eval. Yeah. And that actually broke my heart because, like, for example, I know you treat um, adolescents, mm-hmm. right? So you do child and teen psychiatry, mm-hmm. and hearing like it's heartbreaking to hear about the sheer number of young people who are affected with depression anxiety like and you look at young people and you're like man what is going on why are you so sad i mean it's it's really heartbreaking that during the best years of like your your loving growing open life where Uh you don't have exposure hopefully to too many things that are overwhelming for your brain right um like what's going on there and like how do we help kids access this or like what's is it just that we need to talk we need to talk we need to mm-hmm. what, do, what do you think about that yeah it's so hard and especially covid didn't help because kids were at home kids were isolated from friends doing virtual schooling which not even adults can pay attention to zoom That's meetings right. all day so i don't know how we expect kids and teens to but i just think it covid really put people behind Um, in their emotional age by a few years. And so I think we're seeing the aftermath of kids that had been isolated, not kind of in a, quote, normal school environment. And then it's, you know, parents are busy working, you know, taking care of things so they can put food on the table and support their, their kids. And so there may not be that time or space to just sit down and say, hey, what's going on? How are friends at school and kids these days are so good at being like, fine, everything's good. And Mm -hmm. so then it gets kind of brushed off or people might move on. And so I think for a lot of the kids and teens I see, it's like just creating that safe environment where they know that, okay, every week at this time, I'm going to go talk to this person and really they hear and understand what I'm going through really just provides a great outlet for kids and teens to kind of process and work through some of those emotions. I love that about just the um, the consistency mm-hmm. of setting and scheduling, right? Yes. So I guess that would be a tool too for parents, right? That they yeah. set something where, you know, we talk about stuff going on in the house. Like you mm-hmm. can bring this to the table and this is a time where we don't distract ourselves. There's no right. phone. There's We're not watching TV. Mm-hmm. This is not a – this is a conversation where I'm giving you my undivided attention. Right. I – I have kind of noticed that in society in general, you know, you go out with someone, you know, and you're at dinner with a group of people and half of them are on their phones. Mm -hmm. You could be having the best time ever and you look up and it's (laughs) defeating and you're like, what is so actually important? And this screen Mm -hmm. is not a person. And so that person's also not getting that interaction, the eye contact. Mm -hmm. And there's something really important about just even eye contact that makes Even a person who can't communicate with words or understand anything, you know, infants feel special. It helps them connect. It gives them good feelings and good hormones, right? So is that something we're like losing that we really need to get back in touch with and especially to help kids? Yeah, I think that's a big contributor to why there's been so much social anxiety recently. Mm -hmm. I've seen a lot of kids and teens who are more comfortable Snapchatting their friends at the lunch table who are sitting right across from them than just having a conversation. So I definitely think social media and, you know, this virtual accessibility has contributed to kids being uncomfortable making a phone call. Like these days, I I would personally much rather pick up the phone and call someone than send a text and, you know, go back and forth. But it's the opposite, it seems like, with teens these days. And there's this level of social anxiety behind actually having to communicate and maintain eye contact with someone. 
I 100% yeah. agree with that. And even adults, we're doing this too. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting because if you are talking about something negative, which I don't know if the brain is more apt to like hold negativity than positivity, but it kind of seems that way. And if you're doing it over text, say we're having a conversation and Mm -hmm. I text you and you can't get back to me for an hour. Now I'm reliving whatever we were just talking about repeatedly throughout the day Mm -hmm. when really we were having a short conversation about one thing that happened that lasted 10 minutes. So it's like almost like we're repeating and rehearsing the negativity, right? Because we're now we're reading it, rereading it, coming back to it. And right. that doesn't have to happen. And if we got on the phone, that conversation actually lasted three minutes. Yeah. And I love <laughs> the word intention. So like with text messages, in the intention of a message or words is so unclear. And then you're ruminating about it for, you know, until that person responds. Are they mad at me? Are they running late because something happened or whatever the reason may be? And then it contributes to a cognitive distortion that we talk about in the mental health world called filtering, where you almost focus more on the negative than the positive. So you could have gotten... Natural. Yeah, it, it can happen. Yeah. So you could have gotten 10 texts from friends today saying like, hey, Amber, I miss you so much. <laughs> like, can't wait to see you later. And then you send one text to someone else who then doesn't respond. And you're like, wow, only focusing on that all day rather than oh, no. the 10 positive messages <laughs> that you got. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that does make sense too. Um, and I think too, for maybe critical people who are interested mm-hmm. in like fixing problems or mm-hmm. like, you know, attending to things that they can, uh, I don't know, control or fix right. to improve even. So that actually leads me into like high performance individuals or you treat a lot of executives. Mm-hmm. And obviously we can't talk about who you treat um, as healthcare providers. That's that's a absolute that's no-no. That's a no-no. <laughs> that's a no-no. So no, she can't tell us who she treats, but I'm sure it, they're all really cool, awesome people. <laughs> but what are some of the things that you end up working on with people? And what is a high performance individual? Let's start there. Yeah, I think high performance individuals. Is it me? It's yes. me, right? <laughs> yes, it's definitely you. Go, you're always on the go, 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 looking to see what you can achieve more and doing uh, great things. So yes, Amber is a high wow. performing individual. She really gave me something. Uh, okay, <laughs> uh, but I think that people in all realms, whether they're you know working minimum wage jobs, working you know whatever, professional jobs or executive C-suite people, they're all working in high-stress situations. And so no one's stress is more important than another person's stress. So I'll start there. But I will say I work with a lot of um, executives, professionals, you know, physicians, attorneys, you name it, pro athletes who are all struggling with different things, um, whether it be kind of You know, they people who are highly successful usually have such a assertive, direct personality that especially as professional women can really Mm -hmm. rub people the wrong way sometimes. So how can you like fine tune communication styles, you know, soften things so that not only are you performing at a high level at your job, but then your whole team's behind you and fostering more loyalty and kind of a positive work environment. So I work with people on a lot of communication skills, um, kind of how to create and continue to perform in a high manner. I love that. I also love that you brought up like the challenges specific to women or just a couple of mm-hmm. them because, you know, sometimes it's hel- it's helpful to be a woman because you can kind of soften things in a special way. But mm-hmm. sometimes it's difficult because you have to take on sometimes more authoritarian or male traits mm-hmm. to get a maybe a certain point across or you're in a certain environment that demands your performance is different than the typical I guess, nature of right. what most women would honestly like to be too. Right. Um, so some of that's like almost maybe fighting nature, but it's also inside of some of us. Mm-hmm. Um, so what are some of the things that you you might give as common tips for people to become more successful that they could practice maybe on a daily basis in yeah. that environment? I think one thing that I often talk to people about is helping others get to the conclusion themselves. So rather than, let's say you have um, your front desk person's late every day by 10 minutes, and you're like, instead of saying like, hey, you've been late every day, um, what are we going to do to kind of fix this? Or you're fired, or you need to do better, (laughs) or whatever are all the things coming to mind. where's your watch? (laughs) Yeah, right. And so how can you guide that person to coming to that conclusion on their own? You know, like, hey, I noticed you've been running late, you know, every day the past week. Is there something going on? Or, you know, how can I best help you? What do you need from me 
to kind of meet expectations of this job. So it's a totally different way of approaching the situation, helping that person come to that conclusion on their own. And it's it's almost like a very therapy, therapeutic way of kind of communicating with people. And, you know, I think it can be applied to all realms of life, whether it be personal relationships, work environments, whether it be people at the lateral level or someone that works for you. I think getting people to get to that conclusion on their own is essential. Yeah. I mean, that even goes to like small kids. It's about problem solving. Exactly. Right. For anybody Mm -hmm. at any, any age or stage. Um, So I I really like that. And so when we talk about high performance individuals, Mm -hmm. you don't just treat like CEOs and other kinds of executives and business owners. You also treat athletes. Mm -hmm. Um, How did you get into that? Well, I think with concierge services and looking at people that want kind of in-home services or maybe don't want to be seen in a public clinic, you know, I think that bodes with uh, high performance athletes or pro athletes and maybe people working with pro athletes because um, they don't want to be in the news. They don't want to (laughs) be. Privacy is important. Privacy is very important. And so I think that just kind of naturally led into working with that population. Mm -hmm. So by offering home visits and going to people's homes where they don't have to leave and they're in a very comfortable environment is really helpful to them because the pro sports world is very can be very isolating. You don't know people's intentions of wanting to talk to you. Mm. You don't know intentions of anyone and probably aren't making a whole bunch of new friends at that point in life. So providing things in a comfortable, safe and secure way is really important. So like intention defensive. Mm -hmm. And that can happen to a lot of different people. Um, Do you find that in other areas where you're like, I see this a lot in not just pro athletes, but do you see that a lot in other areas? In what capacity? So I was thinking like you probably will see that in executives or people that kind of might interact with people who almost stop answering the phone because somebody's always asking them for something. Right. Yeah, I think that there is a big kind of um, trust question at the beginning, especially and even like, can you sign an NDA? And it's like, well, yeah. I'm a physician. And so by law, you don't you have know, to do that. It's yeah. private anyway, but exactly. it makes them feel better that exactly. it will never go anywhere. Exactly. So mm-hmm. there's always that kind of suspicion and having their guard up, which is why I think a lot of people seek care outside of their insurance network 100%. because they don't want a diagnosis or, you know, on anything record. on their record. Mm-hmm. I think that that's one of the biggest things is not just the act, like the access, Mm -hmm. the immediate access to your provider that's outside of the insurance-based world. Like, yes, it costs you money out of your pocket, but there are so many perks to that kind of care. The quality tends to be way higher. You see the same provider that you know, Mm -hmm. that you've built a relationship with that you trust time and time again. Right. Now I have a trusted opinion. And when I call you, I know when you're going to answer. When I see you, I know all of those things. In insurance world, I may see someone for five or 10 minutes. I filled out 10 questionnaires Mm -hmm. every single time I came in. You don't know what I'm in there for. You have no idea. In your business, if I call in, you're going to get a note, a memo that says, hey, this person's coming in for this. Mm -hmm. You're not going to ask. You're going to ask me because it's part of your job. But you know before you, you did your homework. Right. You know, if I go into my regular doctor and I had knee pain, they asked me, so what are you here for? Oh, your right shoulder? Did you look at the paper, sir? Like, did you look at the paper? So right. I think it's a frustration, um, qualm. Like, mm-hmm. already just going to a private provider, that's what I choose to do. Beyond that, not having something that shows up that negatively could impact me later mm-hmm. feels secure. It doesn't matter what it is or what comes up, but it feels safer to do that. And I don't know, but I'm hearing more people say that, and that's a reason that they're seeking it out. Are there other differentiators that you think – People should really consider using this instead of their insurance because. Yeah, it's it's hard because so, people have to do what they're comfortable with. And so mm-hmm. it can be really expensive to see someone outside of your insurance network. And there's no guarantee that your insurance company will reimburse for the super bills that right. that private provider can provide. So I never like to push people to do that if, if it's not feasible for them. Mm-hmm. But like you mentioned, there's several perks And in defense of the insurance providers, it's tough because they're given so many patients a day. An impossible productivity standard. Exactly. Impossible productivity standards, high overheads that they have to meet. So their only option is to see patients in a limited 
time slot to meet their numbers. Mm -hmm. And so I think the benefit of, of kind of our jobs in private practice is that we can see patients for however long we want. If you want to spend two hours with one of your patients, you Mm -hmm. can. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's the beauty in, in private care is really providing what the patient needs at that time. And this week, it may be a two hour appointment a month from now, it may be a, a 30 minute, but you have that flexibility and your own kind of your own input in how you want to structure your day. So that piece alone changed my life. Mm -hmm. Um, So tell me about the impact of that, like understanding what the clinic setting does and understanding what private practice setting does. How do you feel like that impacts like your, like you want to speak to quality of life or like how it changes your day and how I feel like I'm a much more effective provider because I have limited time slots and I can spend more time. It literally makes me feel good Mm -hmm. to help someone in that way instead of like cramming them through the door like we're some kind of puppy mill. Right. It it literally was feeling horrible. So can you speak to that a little bit about how your day goes and how if it's more rewarding or... Yeah, I think I have a big combination of just medication management patients, which are um, shorter appointments, but it's short in my world is 30 minutes, which uh-huh. is probably longer than a lot of insurance-based clinics. Mm-hmm. Um, so I have, you know, a good mix of that. I have uh, therapy patients I see for an hour. I have home visits that could last two hours. You know, there's a lot of fluctuation. And then the frequency can change too. Sometimes there's a big stressor and I see someone weekly for a little bit and then maybe things are going really well again and we check in uh, every month or every other month. So there's just so much flexibility. And like you said, it's just rewarding to be able to provide that care. Mm -hmm. You're like, wow, I feel really good. We like got everything that we need to talk about. And like, I'm not like chasing them out the door like, oh, and this and I forgot this. So no, I just love... I love the way that private practice flows because it it just feels like really good care. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I obviously, if your provider feels good and they're coming in with their own kind of needs met, yeah. they're doing a better job. You know, when you go to work and it's like most people have a job. Before I owned a business, I went to work to get a paycheck. Mm-hmm. Now I actually have more purpose than that. Right? It's actually about the mission of my company. It's about my personal purpose. And when I go home and I feel fulfilled, I come to work more fulfilled. And I want to be able to change their energy in one session. I want them to walk away feeling better. Um, I know that that's that's literally a thing. Every time I talk to you, I feel better. And we don't have to be talking about anything that's personal. It's just about spending time. And everybody wants Mm -hmm. that. Um, I think that for business owners in general, if you're not giving people that kind of experience, like Mm -hmm. I'm sure that you talk about really hard things. But is it a is it a purpose of a, a session to help people feel better or is it sometimes not at all? It depends because I think sometimes it's it's about talking about the hard stuff that maybe the person has been suppressing or it doesn't really want to acknowledge as a problem. But I always feel that at the end of a session, it's productive. And maybe that's the best word. And Mm -hmm. so, you know, things aren't always happy all Mm -hmm. the time because people are coming in with stressors. But I feel that the sessions are productive. And I think my patients do, too, because they keep coming back. (laughs) (laughs) That's probably a good sign. Yeah. (laughs) That's a great sign. People like me. Uh, I love that. So um, when you're treating one person, and is this like a common phenomenon that you end up seeing a whole family or like couples or like, again, you you treat a sports team now Mm -hmm. or two, the Suns and the the Mercury. is it really common that you end up seeing, you know, family members and et cetera? Or is that not a thing when you, you know, do you tap into, oh, now we do combo sessions or couple sessions? How do you determine those things and yeah. how do people ask? Yeah, I think couples therapy is its own thing. So there are a lot of couples therapists out there that will just see couples because with that specifically, it would be recommended that each person person in the couple have their own individual therapist. Mm -hmm. So I don't do any couples therapy work. I'll often work with um, like a parent and a child Mm. or kind of like more family therapy type things, or maybe seeing parents in a session to discuss their child. Um, But it's not couples therapy, if that makes sense. So I, I do see family members, but it's, it's much more about the family structure and integrating that and making it more positive in terms of communication and parenting skills rather than uh, couples work. So with teens, 
Is that a common thing? Like, I think that if I were a teenager and I was going to a session, I would mm-hmm. almost feel fear maybe that somebody was going to tell my parent about the stuff that I was talking about in there. So is that a thing that you have to report or is it about based on the privacy of the teenager? I think that would maybe be something cool to talk about. Yeah, that's a good question. So the law is that I cannot share with a parent anything that a teen tells me unless they're at risk of hurting themselves, uh, at risk of hurting others, or something that I'm really worried is putting their life at risk, like if they're using hardcore drugs and running away in the middle of the night or, you know, Mm -hmm. something that could really pose a safety threat. Um, But other than that, I tell both parents and the teens, you know, please don't ask me about anything specific. If there's a red flag, we'll certainly discuss it. But oftentimes I'll check with a teen before we bring a parent into the room, like, hey, I was thinking of sharing this, this, or this from the session. Would you be comfortable with that? And kind of having that collaborative discussion with the teen before the parent comes in. Got it. What are some of the therapeutic approaches that you, so obviously um, you're a psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that you might be assessing when someone comes in is, is there a need for actual medication intervention Mm -hmm. or treatment for this person in front of me? And what happens after that? Yeah. So usually in an evaluation, I'll kind of screen for different issues or symptoms. I don't really like to slap a diagnosis on someone right away, um, but looking to see is anxiety a problem, ADHD, is parenting at home an issue, just kind of getting a big picture of what the child's life is like or the teen's life, what their biggest stressors are, and assessing their readiness to start medication if it's indicated. So if someone says, you know, I really want to try therapy first and go down that route with you before starting medication, then we'll kind of just proceed with different therapeutic approaches like cognitive behavioral therapy, psychodynamic therapy, whatever it may be. What are those? So those are different types. <laughs> That's like a whole conversation in and of itself. But the CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy is the most common one. And that's essentially how uh, the triangle of how thoughts, feelings, and behaviors all impact each other and how maybe changing thoughts um, can redirect and make more productive behaviors and, and subsequently emotions. Mm-hmm. So that's the most common one is CBT, and that's mainly used for anxiety and depression. I love that. Yeah. I'm definitely working on changing my thoughts to positive <laughs> ones. You know, like it's, it's helpful throughout the day to be yeah. able to identify things that are impacting you negatively. And if you can impact the source, then we've basically solved the whole exactly. problem, right? Exactly. That's interesting. Is that something that you guys use primarily? Like what's your, what do you think is all of your therapist's most common intervention? Would you say it was CBT? I think CBT is very common because anxiety and depression are very common. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of the gold standard therapy for anxiety and depression is CBT. And it's very effective, like you said, for everyone who you're like connecting the dots of, okay, this situation made me think this. And then that thought made me feel this. And then based on that thought and feeling, I acted in this way. And maybe had we backed up and altered the thought initially, then it might have led to a different emotion and behavior. Someone gave me an analogy of this the other day Mm -hmm. that um, feelings, negative feelings, are like if I touch fire and it's something I know is hot and it's causing pain. And so Mm -hmm. that pain triggers a reflex that says remove it. Mm -hmm. Like I have to cause change to change how it's feeling. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what was the pain? It was my thought. The thought was the pain. That's the generator for the whole thing. And I thought that that was really useful. Of course, I don't want to touch fire. Like I need to put a glove (laughs) on. I need to back up. Like something has to happen so I'm not burning. Um, And I just thought that that was like a really interesting analogy. And it made it more useful to me like Mm -hmm. each day. Oh, I can practice that. That doesn't feel nice. Okay, great. Like I can change that because it's really generated by how I think or perceive something's happening around me. And it's that simple, right? Right. Yeah. And and (laughs) that's why I, you know, I laugh because I'm thinking of all the corporate executives or people that, you know, are excellent professionals that we go back to the basics and I'm like, here's this thought record I would like you to fill out over the next wow, week. thought record. Yeah. Cool. That, so there's a bunch of worksheets on thought records where you can identify the situation, what the quote automatic thought is. That's a CBT term of like, you know, I felt stupid or I felt dumb or I felt, you know, invalidated. And then what the feeling and the subsequent behavior was. I love that you're talking about this related to high performance individuals because everyone suffers this. And I think Mm -hmm. sometimes we think of people that we imagine are such powerful leaders, even 
any anybody can yeah. we suffer from ego we suffer from uh insecurity we suffer from anxiety like right everyone ha- everyone suffers those everyone has something everyone yeah. has something and so it's it just feels good to hear hear you say it in that way and that all of us need to work on those things mm-hmm. because it doesn't matter where we are we can all make improvements exactly everyone can um, I, I love that. That's super useful. Are there other things that you're like, man, when I run into people and I notice that they're having a high emotion, it could be anybody. Mm-hmm. It could be somebody who come across in the grocery that just can't find something <sighs> or is yelling at a kid or whatever it is that you use as a tool for your own thoughts to like protect yourself or think of for others that kind of is helpful. Yeah. I kind of just try and identify to myself that they're probably going through something else and then they're projecting or displacing those emotions on <laughs> whether it be the self-checkout machine or whatever <laughs> it might be. So I think that I'm, I'm pretty quick because of what I do to identify that there's probably something else going on. And it's not you. Yeah, and it's, it's not, not about not, you. <laughs> exactly. It is not about me. I'm fully aware of that. <laughs> but I think that that could be really challenging for people who might be highly sensitive or have kind of like acute emotions or things like that. And so I think teaching people the tools to de decentralize it from themselves mm-hmm. is helpful of, you know, there could be a million other reasons why this is happening. Your boss didn't walk by you and not say hello because they hate you. Maybe <laughs> they just like were running out the door and they were late dropping their kids off and, you know, they've had a horrible morning. And it's, it has nothing to do with you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love that. Um, so I went to your office and it's absolutely gorgeous. Thank do you want to tell everybody where your office is? Sure. So we are located on Scottsdale Road, um, just north of the train park. So we're at Cheney and Scottsdale Road. Yeah, and it is absolutely gorgeous. Very inviting when you walk in. Thank the you. rooms are big. I really like that because each of the treatment rooms were were spacious. And mm-hmm. a lot of times you go in and you're like in this little cubby closet, basically, yeah. <laughs> on a couch, which is great. No windows. Yeah. Yeah. And I was um, talking to one of your providers and she does like yoga stuff, like mm-hmm. with some of her uh, kids or like with children with ADHD and yeah. like helping them recenter and refocus. I just thought it sounded really cool about the different kinds of things a lot of your providers use. How many providers do you have right now? We have, I believe, eight or nine total. Are they all female? So we have three males now. We're okay. we're building, yeah, <laughs> we're building the male energy. Okay, <laughs> yeah. okay, keeping some balance. Uh-huh. I like that. Yes. Um, and are there anything, any things that uh, some of the other providers treat that uh, are specific to something else you guys are growing into? Yeah, so we have a new psychiatrist joining us next month. That's really unique where he also did a sleep fellowship background. So he is not only a psychiatrist, but he will also be this July sleep medicine physician. His name is Dr. Michael Bowen, and he'll be offering kind of cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia and be able to really treat um, sleep disorders as well. Wow. I didn't even know that was a thing. Yeah. Yep. Well, how does that even work? They do a sleep study on you to assess how you're sleeping, or is this related to the assessment as far as I'm reporting symptoms? Both. So he can kind of prescribe an at-home sleep study um, and kind of evaluate if there's a reason to do an in-lab sleep study. Uh, And then he can also kind of just based on history diagnose something else that might be going on. And for people who don't know what an in-lab sleep study is, it's where you actually go and sleep in yep. a room at a clinic and they measure your brain waves while you sleep, right? Like yes. brain activity. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a patient that got one of these and not not for that, but he mm-hmm. got he got one and I came into the to his house the next time and he had completely shaved all of his head oh off, gosh, which you do sure. not have to do if you go in. <laughs> and, but we all laugh about it to this day. Like, oh, remember when you shaved all your hair off for your sleep study? <laughs> it was funny. Yes. You don't have to shave your hair if you go in for a sleep study. Yeah, folks. if that's the one takeaway from today. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's really cool. Are there any other special things you want to highlight about your business today? I think that we just have a lot of unique uh, physicians and psychologists there that have such different specialties everywhere from sport and performance psychology um, to yoga nidra therapy to um, high level kind of like ADHD and professional women. So there's a bunch of specialties and I, I love all of our clinicians. They each bring something different to the table. You uh, recently did a uh, speaking event for a women's professional group about burnout. I thought was so incredibly 
helpful to myself because like, wow, I didn't even realize a lot of these things. So, you know, seeking out care from someone who's a specialist in a Mm -hmm. certain field, even if you think you don't have these issues or any issues might be a good baseline assessment of things that you can really do to hike your performance. Um, Whether that's in your home and in your relationship and even if you don't work or if you have a job and you're struggling or you want to switch careers and you're struggling, right? All of these areas are things that you could help with. Definitely. Yeah. Burnout's just so prevalent these days (laughs) and (laughs) underdiagnosed. I'm burnt out from laundry. You know what I mean? I'm just burnt (laughs) out from it. So I really like that. Um, I I love referring patients to you. Thank Thank you so much for always taking care of people so well. I think that that I, you, you have my trust. Um, I, I've really appreciated that. And I just want to thank you, Dr. Brooke, for coming on today. Again, this is Dr. Brooke Chalet from Chalet Wellness, a concierge psychiatry and therapy company here in Scottsdale, Arizona. Thank you, Dr. Amber, for having me on today. Absolutely. Absolutely.